thanks for tuning in um, to the webinar and thanks to John and the Glow Fouling Partnership um, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so a quick plug to get us started. Um, as John said, I work at the Cawthron Institute um, in Sunny Nelson. Um, so Cawthron is New Zealand's largest um, independent science organisation um, and we offer a broad range of services to help protect the environment um, and support sustainable development of primary industries. And um, I'm based in the biosecurity team um, and we work, work closely with the aquaculture industry on a range of issues across all sectors. Um, and so today I'm gonna to talk to you about how biofouling is affecting um, the New Zealand salmon industry in particular. Um, so the New Zealand um, salmon industry, we farm Chinook salmon um, and we produce about 50% um, of the global supply. Um, and uh, this is worth around $110 um, million in export revenue. So um, on a global scale, it's not a very big industry, I guess, um, but it's really important um, regionally and nationally um, in terms of jo jobs and um, economic earnings for New Zealand. Um, and so salmon are produced in three regions um, of the South Island, um, including freshwater farms in the hydro canals. Um, but the most production is um, sea cage farming and um, the majority is in um, the Marlborough Sounds region, which is at the top of um, New Zealand's uh, South Island. So biofouling accumulation um, presents an ongoing operational challenge for finfish aquaculture globally. Um, so farms have a considerable amount of submerged surfaces, um, and this includes the cage structures themselves, and, as well as the mooring lines and the um, production nets. And biofouling adds weight and drag on the farms, and growth on the nets can also lead to reduced water flow through the pens. And this has associated effects um, to fish health because of um, reduced oxygen into the farm and also the reduced removal of waste out of the farm. Um, so in New Zealand, um, we often use a double net system um, because we have to protect the fish um, from predators such as seals. So we have quite a lot of seals in New Zealand. Um, so essentially the fish are um, in individual pens and then the whole farm is surrounded in a second net um, which has larger openings. And this is called the predator net. Um, so having biofouling growth on both these nets has the potential to um, severely affect water flow um, within the farm. So here's an idea of what a salmon farm net looks like um, underwater. So ideally um, our nets would be clean and they would look like those ones on the left um, with no biofouling gro growth to block the water flow through the farm. Um, however, um, after only a few weeks, we can get considerable growth um, on these nets and they more often than not look like the ones on the right with biofouling present on the submerged um, surfaces. And the majority um, of finfish aquaculture um, industry globally uses um, biocidal anti-fouling paints to manage this growth. Um, and mostly this is um, copper-based coatings, although there's some alternatives utilizing um, different biocides that are also available. And the effectiveness of these coatings decreases through time. Um, so the nets either need to be um, removed and replaced or they need to be managed using um, cleaning in the later stages of the coating life. Um, however, leaching of the copper um, within these paints, it presents an environmental hazard um, as it can accumulate in the sediments um, and that potentially affects the benthic communities that live in these areas. So um, in the New Zealand salmon industry, um, we only ever used anti-fouling um, coatings on the outer predator net um, and these nets were treated, placed on the farm and left in place for up to two years um, before they were removed and replaced. And the inner pen nets um, were managed using a process called lift and blast. And this is where the fish um, were moved to a neighboring pen and the net is raised out of the water and it's manually cleaned um, through water blasting and then it's left to dry um, before it's put back in the water and the fish are moved back in. Um, and these pens were generally cleaned on a four week cycle um, as that's how long it took to get around um, all of the pens in a farm. So they would start in one and then move around. 
Um, but so due to concerns regarding um, the environmental impacts of um, copper-based coatings and the public perception surrounding this, um, the New Zealand salmon industry has um, moved away from the use of anti-fouled nets. And there's been largely no use of anti-fouling since um, around 2012. Um, in addition, over roughly the last five years, um, most of the salmon farms in New Zealand have transitioned to larger um, 40 by 40 meter um, style pens. And we used to have 20 by 20 was the size of the original farms. Um, and so these new larger nets are too large to be lifted out of the water. Um, and so um, the lift and blast um, process is no longer possible. And so basically all the production nets in New Zealand salmon farms are now cleaned um, in water instead um, using specialized high pressure cleaning machines. And there's some examples of some of the options that are available here on the slide. And the pen nets are now cleaned um, up to weekly in summer um, with these cleaning activities um, often operating on really tight schedules because there's only a certain number of cleaning machines and vessels and they have to get around um, all of the farms. Um, so here's an example of a New Zealand made um, autonomous cleaning machine, the Autoboss. Um, so it essentially crawls around um, the inside of the pen. So it has these little like fingers that it holds onto the net with and then it moves itself along the sides. And basically the um, cleaning part of the machine is lowered and raised up and be um, below that bit that's above the water. And um, as a standard industry practice, um, there's no waste capture during this process. So the biofouling that's um, dislodged off the pens um, is released into the environment. And so around the time the farm switched to in-water net cleaning, um, the fish started to develop skin health issues. Uh, so circular spots and lesions um, are generally the most common, although sometimes the skin damage can also be found in lines on the skin. Um, and fish with spots uh, were found to be more vulnerable to pathogens. Um, with the initial skin trauma, it's often followed by a secondary infection, um, in particular in the summer months. And these skin health issues uh, represent an economic loss to the company um, due to downgrades of the fish at processing. So um, they're not worth as much um, as a like perfect salmon. Um, in addition, um, if the spots progress to more severe ulcers, this can also be associated with fish mortality in some cases. And so the location of these spots um, was suggestive of the fish contacting something in the water column, um, and it was possible that there could be a relationship with the biofouling community um, that was being dislodged during net cleaning. And so this brings us to the nadarians, um, which is a group of animals that possess the ability to sting. And so this includes uh, sea anemones, corals, sea pens, hydroids, and jellyfish. Um, and they're often a domin dominant member of biofilling communities. Um, so a good example of this is um, the salmon aquaculture nets in Norway. So um, they're often completely covered in a monoculture of hydroids. And so a unique feature um, of this group is that they have these um, like little harpoons um, stinging cells and they're called nematocysts and they use these to capture prey and for defense against predators. And so the nematocyst, um, it contains a barb and then that can release toxins um, and the thread often features spines that present, prevent um, the barb being removed from the target after it's stung. And so some species um, release their nematocysts directly when they're disturbed and some species produce um, these mucus strings. So a picture of the, the picture on the right there is of the white striped anemone with lots of um, these mucus strings it's released. Um, and each of those can contain thousands of um, nematocysts. So following the initial skin health issues, um, Cawthron carried out a survey of nets and pontoons at three salmon farms um, during August 2013. Um, and the we found eight species of um, nadarians present on these farms, um, and they were found in really high densities. Um, so this assessed um, communities at 5, 10, and 15 metres, um, and also the pontoons, which are the structures that hold the nets up. 
And so we found um, up to 10,000 individuals per meter um, squared for the hydroid ectopleura. So that's that uh, white picture in the middle there with the pink hearted hydroid. And then also up to 1,600 individuals per meter squared for the white striped anemone anthophoe. So that's the anemone um, on the left of the screen there. Um, and we were also made aware of another smaller transparent anemone, um, which is only really present on the farms during the summer months. Um, and so we did some molecular analysis um, on this this species and um, confirmed it to be um, within the Viatrix genus. Um, and at present, there's only five species that have been described. Um, and it was found to be most closely related to the turtle grass anemone um, found in the Caribbean. Um, and that species is known to be really highly toxic and there's actually um, warning sheets for divers in that region. Um, but yeah, interestingly, in this small anemone had never been previously described in New Zealand. Um, so we're uncertain as to whether it's an um, invasive species. Um, so more recently, um, we've carried out lab-based investigations into the biology um, of the most common anemones present on the farms. Um, so we had a student, Beth, um, working on this topic last summer, and she did some really nice work investigating um, nematocyst length and how this relates to potential risk. Um, so we found that the average nematocyst length um, for all three species that she looked at um, was larger than the mean skin thickness um, for salmon of a range of sizes. Um, and so this supports the theory um, that nematocysts may be causing the initial skin trauma. Um, also, the nematocyst length of two of these species was shown to not significantly increase with an enemy size. Um, so that's the plot on the right. And um, that's really interesting because it indicates um, that the anemones are a risk to the fish right from the beginning, right from when they first settle, um, as opposed to what we had theorized that maybe they had to get to a certain size before they were able to sting the fish. Um, but actually, really, really small anemones um, have nematocysts of a suitable length. And the salmon industry um, has also carried out some projects investigating the risk of anemones to their stock. Um, so they looked at settlement rates for the transparent anemones specifically, um, and that's the plot on the left, and it showed um, that it's a really rapid colonizer of cleaned nets. Um, so they found up to 270 anemones per 10 centimeters squared after only seven days. Um, and that's roughly the length of time that the nets are left between cleaning and the summer at the moment. And they also found higher settlement at the 10 to 15 meter depth range, which was interesting. Um, they've also carried out some basic challenge trials, uh, exposing fish to the mucus strings produced by the white striped anemone. Um, and the results indicated the stings can cause severe damage over um, only a really short um, amount of time. And so fish have a pretty good natural defense system um, in their skin and their scales. Um, but once that um, system is breached, for instance, um, by sting, um, they're a lot more vulnerable to pathogens, um, thermal stress, and other factors that can increase mortality. And this is particularly relevant at the moment um, with rising water temperatures, an increasing issue for most salmon farming regions in New Zealand, um, particularly in the Marlborough Sounds. Um, which is our main uh, growing region. And we've had, so five of the last seven summers um, have been the hottest on record. So we're recording water temperatures of up to 20 degrees in the summer months, um, which is really not ideal for salmon farming. And increased water temperatures have been associated with um, bacterial infections and with the fish less resilient to external stresses. So I always like this um, picture. It's a really nice illustration of this. Um, it's a scanning electron microscope micrograph um, from the margin of a skin lesion on an Atlantic salmon in Norway. So the fish at that farm were affected by a jellyfish bloom um, with a subsequent tenacity baculosis outbreak. And so if you look at the zoomed micrograph on the right, um, it shows the bacteria entering the holes where the nematocysts have pierced the fish skin. Um, and the recent increase in jellyfish blooms globally um, has been associated with climate change and warming sea temperatures. Um, so this could become a more regular occurrence in the future. Um, we also believe it's um, another important thing to note is uh, that the New Zealand agriculture industry is moving towards offshore farming. Um, and we currently don't know what types of biofouling organisms are going to settle in um, these environments. 
So we know anemones um, prefer high current cool waters, um, and that was really nicely illustrated in a recent assessment of an offshore mussel farm um, in the North Island, and the farm structures were completely covered in anemones. And so it's really important um, that the industry considers the implications of biofilling growth um, and how this will be managed in these future um, offshore farms. Um, and we believe it's crucial to understand the biology and ecology of problem taxa um, as this enables more effective management of risk. Um, so some of our ongoing research topics uh, in this space include um, characterizing the spatial and temporal patterns of recruitment of higher risk taxa, um, including relating these to current net cleaning schedules. So we recently carried out quite a large field component for this, um, which involved deployments during summer and winter, um, looking at how fast the biofouling growth so, um, grows over a range of um, deployment ages. So we're analyzing um, those photos and, and assessing that at the moment. Um, we're also assessing the toxicity of a specific species um, to determine if they're producing bioactive compounds um, and including looking at if some are more toxic than others. So in particular, we're really interested in the transparent anemone and whether that's got any um, interesting toxins. And we're also looking into the microbiome composition um, of different species to determine if they have um, specific bacterial agents related to skin health issues, um, because it's been found in jellyfish in particular that they often have um, a sort of mutual relationship with tenacity um, um bacteria and they use them to pre-digest food. So we're interested in whether the anemones are doing a similar thing. And lastly, um, this upcoming summer, we plan to characterize the net cleaning waste, um, including the viability of the nematocysts within this. Um, so the Nadarian problem in um, New Zealand salmon farms is not an easy fix. Um, and there's a need to develop more effective on-farm management of these species. Um, in particular, a focus on fish health and fish survival um, through the optimization of rearing conditions and the elimination of stresses is really crucial. And this could include a range of approaches, um, including uh, management based on biology, uh, anti-fouling strategies, cleaning strategies, and therapeutic approaches. And our research um, feeds into this management. Um, for example, optimized cleaning schedules for specific sites, seasons, or times since last cleaning, um, when the stinging organisms are less likely to pose a risk. Um, so in summary, um, while there are environmental advantages to not using biocides, um, untreated nets require regular in-water cleaning. Um, and as this is generally un undertaken without waste recapture, um, all the biofilling is released into the pen environment. Um, and exposure of the fish to this material um, can cause skin health issues and fish are more vulnerable um, to pathogens and um, thermal stress. And understanding the biology and ecology of high-risk biofouling taxa can lead to more efficient management of risk. And improved management of salmon health issues in New Zealand farms has been estimated to be worth up to $40 million a year in additional revenue by 2030. So it's a really important um, topic to be focusing on. Um, so I just want to thank the numerous colleagues at Cawthron um, who've been part of this work over the years and also New Zealand King Salmon um, who have been really awesome in supporting the field aspects of our research. And lastly, um, MB for funding um, this research through their Endeavour Fund. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>